get the presenter. I uh, will call upon our Queensland chapter president, Asoka Tittagala, to say a few words about our chapter and uh, activities. Yeah, I'll come back to you later. Thank you, Shamil. My name is Asoka Tittagala, and I am the current president of the Queensland chapter. Thanks to all attendees for committing your valuable time to participate in this webinar today on a very timely topic. While you are eagerly looking forward for this presentation to commence, please allow me to take just three or four minutes to give you some history of the formation of the Queensland chapter and an update on the activities we engage in for the benefit of both our membership and the Queensland community. This slide will give you an overview of the different activities we engage in. Queensland Chapter was established as an incorporated non-for-profit association of Queensland in 2016. We are therefore the youngest of the overseas chapters, formed just about 100 years after the inception of the IESL in Sri Lanka in 1906. We have a current membership strength of 67 and growing with more and more of Sri Lankan origin engineers coming on board at a steady pace. Our members are employed across all sectors of the Queensland economy, ranging from mining and resources to energy, infrastructure, public utilities, research and development. As you would be aware, Queensland is geographically the second largest state of Australia. And our membership is also spread far and wide across the metropolitan and regional areas, enjoying a tropical lifestyle. The Queensland chapter is now in its fourth year of operations. And we have been active on many fronts with membership expansion drives, conducting of regular CPD events, issue of periodic newsletters, fundraising activity, and other social events. With the impact of the pandemic this year, we have strengthened our ICT capabilities and were able to continue to conduct our business with little impediment. The event you are attending now was also formally planned to be presented to a physical audience but was switched over to online delivery mode to comply. Please visit our website and have a look through our Facebook and LinkedIn profiles and contact us for further information on the process of gaining membership and on any other aspects. Thank you for listening and I shall now hand you back to Dr. Shamil Maka. Thank you, Asoka, for those words. Now, uh, let me introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Associate Professor Mithula Nadaraja. For those who you don't, don't know Mithula, he's currently the postgraduate coordinator and director of research training at the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Dr. Mithulan has over 25 years experience in academia and in industry. He graduated from the University of Peradeniya and has completed a master's degree at the Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok. He then went on to complete a PhD at the University of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Before Mithulan joined the University of Queensland, he is undertake a number of uh, professional positions, including two years at the, as a planning engineer at the Generation Planning Division at Ceylon Electricity Board, and uh, another year as a project leader at the Center for Excellence in Electrical Power Technology in Chulongolon University in Thailand. 
Jonathan has been prolific in research as well. To date, he has supervised some 50 research master students and 23 post uh, doctoral students at AIT and UQ. He has published over 250 research articles, including a book entitled Intelligent Integration of Renewable Distributed Generation. And he has worked for so many organizations, his projects have been funded by a whole range of sponsors, including European Union uh, and agencies like Swe Swedish International Development Agency, NORAD, Australian Research Council, CSIRO, and Australian Power Institute. So as you can see, he comes with a uh, well credentialed and a lot of experience. And now I call upon Mithulan to give his presentation. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Shamal, for that um, very generous introduction. And I hope uh, all of you can hear me. And uh, yeah, um, about 25 years uh, to 30 years back, no experts or um, power industry, the relevant power industry uh, predicted this level of uh, renewable energy penetration in, uh, in power grid. So imagine we are going to have 100% renewable energy penetration. So this means a lot of things, including uh, better energy security and less rely on, uh, reliance on uh, imported oils and coal, so the topic today is achieving 100% renewable energy. We are going to be looking at uh, technical challenges and potential solutions. In uh, potential solutions, I'm going to highlight some of the research work we have been doing at the University of Queensland, of course, with my colleagues and uh, uh, PhD students. So the talk today, um, we are going to look at the, the driver the main factor which, I, which is driving the, the development of uh, the, uh, uh, the renewable energy. And then we are going to look at the growth of uh, renewable energy technology and looking at uh, both uh, wind as well as uh, solar technology. And then we will look at the technical challenges. And uh, first we are going to look at uh, the distribution level uh, technical challenges and then transmission uh, level technical challenges. I also thought that it's relevant to bring uh, two uh, current uh, blackout incidents, which can be associated with the, the high penetration of renewable energy, just to highlight there are problems as well. We have to be prepared for that one. And then we will move on to solutions. At the end, I'm going to wrap up the presentation with a summary and a way forward. So look at the, um, the 20th century and 21st century by far, the global warming and climate change is the biggest concern, leaving the COVID-19 aside. And then there are a lot of evidence mounting towards pointing out the, the problem of global warming and uh, climate change. Uh, melting of uh, glaciers and then uh, uh, increase in uh, ocean heat content and also sea level rise. And there are unpredictable weather patterns and dry in some part of the world and then uh, flooding, unseasonal flooding in some other part, the part of the world, which are also leading to epidemics. So a lot of problems suggesting uh, that uh, we have a, an issue of uh, this uh, global warming and climate change. The experts who have been monitoring the, the uh, sea level temperature find a rec uh, remarkable re recovery of uh, discovery of CO2, level of CO2 and, and the global warming. So the CO2 level has been increasing in the environment. When we look at the source of uh, uh, this, uh, the, the, the sources contribute to the CO2, definitely power sector is one of the major sector is contributing that one, which is next to the transportation sector and our agriculture se sector. So this uh, driver, the, this problem um, had uh, pushed many governments all around the world to look for uh, policy initiatives to go for a better and sustainable type of energy. So renewable energy was found to be the best alternative to come combat uh, the power sector contribution of the, the climate change. 
So about uh, three decades back, uh, grid integration started, just started with only uh, in the form of biomass or rice husk or bagasse. Very, very little uh, uh, progression in that uh, renewable energy. During the last two decades, wide, uh, so many options are, are coming up. And then uh, wind and solar are becoming the natural choices for many countries. Because uh, when it comes to wind and solar, the, the, what I call it, uh, the fuel is free delivery at no cost or maybe very less cost. We have uh, plenty of uh, sunshine and the wind in our backyards. So when we look at the growth of this one, so th this uh, uh, slides is coming from, this information is coming from the, the global uh, uh, renewable energy status report that was released a week back. That was exactly on the, the 19th of June. I, I managed to grab uh, the latest information uh, from that one. When we look at the renewable energy growth, we can see in 2019, we had a mammoth uh, a growth of uh, 200 gigawatts of renewable added in the in the in, in power system globally. This uh, out of this uh, 200 uh, gigawatts, about 57 percent uh, of uh, the uh, technologies uh, uh, or the renewable energy is on PV. So PV had like uh, uh, 115 gigawatts uh, uh, of insulation and uh, uh, about 60 uh, gigawatts from wind. As you can see, majority of uh, th these insulations are uh, uh, shared uh, between uh, the PV and the, and, the, and the wind. And then there are other small uh, technologies also contributing, uh, such as hydro and then biomass. And then 2019, interestingly, was the fourth consecutive year where we had 50 gigawatt or more installed capacity of uh, wind power generation. So and when we zoom in uh, PV technology, so this uh, slide shows the, the cumulative capacity of the PV technology over the last 10 years. We can see in 2019, we had a, a, a total installed capacity of 627 gigawatts of uh, PV insulation, as we know, PV, when it comes to PV, um, like any other technology, any other renewable energy technologies, the intermittency is a problem. And the other thing is the plant factor is the problem. So we may need a large footprint to produce a little energy, but still there are some better side and positive side of this one. So solar PV uh, uh, installed capacity just over 100 giga gigawatt, 30 in a row. And then 18 countries, so these are some of the highlights. 18 countries added more than one gigawatt uh, uh, in, in 2019. So 39 countries have the cumulative capacity of uh, one gigawatt or more. So we can see a massive development going on in, uh, in, in PV technology as well. When we look at the wind energy, so this is the story with the wind energy. So wind energy actually started uh, well before PV technology but the PV technology is catching up. As of 2019, we, have, uh, we had about 651 gigawatts of uh, wind. And then when it comes to wind technology, the, the first uh, generation technology was uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, induction uh, generator base and followed by the, there was some development on that one, doubly fed induction generators and then uh, fully uh, 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 inverter based uh, uh, generators. So, there are uh, issues with these technologies as well. That's what we are going to look at uh, later in the, in, the, in, the, in the slides. It's not like a traditional uh, coal-fired power plant where we have the synchronous machine, which had undergone uh, uh, years and years of research and development. And then these are relatively new technologies. So if you look at some highlights with uh, wind energy, in 2016, we had uh, 651 gigawatts of installed capacity. And then uh, this is the sixth uh, consecutive year where we had uh, 50 gigawatts or more uh, uh, installed capacity. Out of the 60 um, gigawatt new addition, about 54 was uh, onshore. So onshore and offshore are popular, and six was uh, six gigawatts was uh, offshore. And then definitely, when it comes to the major players, and then uh, European countries are, 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 are dominating. And then about 75% of the global capacity is installed in, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, Europe. 
And then by the end of 2019, 17 countries had offshore wind capacity. The, the slide over here <coughs> shows the uh, uh, different share of uh, uh, renewable uh, the wind energy capacity. So Europe is, uh, if you can see this graph, my arrow, so Europe had the major, major share followed by Asia and, and North America. And then uh, here we have uh, different uh, uh, offshore capacities. Now, definitely the, uh, the growth of the PV and, and wind are on the increase, um, even though they are slowed down uh, due to some uh, regulatory issues, but those regulatory issues have been fixed. And then many countries are working towards uh, this 100% renewable energy. And definitely, in addition to uh, PV and wind, other technologies such as biomass, hydro, and ge uh, geothermal, tidal, uh, other renewable energy technologies are also contributing in this one. If we look at the installations, a significant number of uh, 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 renewable energy, PV in particular, it's happening in the distribution level. So in the form of uh, rooftop, uh, rooftop of uh, household, but also um, a rooftop of uh, commercial and, and, and industrial buildings. So when we focus on the technical challenges, the technical challenges faced by the distribution system is quite different from the technical challenges faced by the transmission system. Of course, when there are major problems in the transmission system, that can lead to blackouts and, 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 and chaotic type of situation. So if you look at the, the, the technical challenges collectively, some of the technical challenges are uh, minor and uh, an operation engineer intervention is enough to deal with that one. Some other technical challenges are major. That means we have to have a, a, a good R&D and then a solution should be planned well ahead before accommodating uh, a, a good percentage of renewable energy. So that's what we are going to be focusing in, a, in, in my presentation today. So let us look at uh, the technical challenges in the distribution system. So looking at the technical challenges, we can, um, a number of you may recall, uh, 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 remember about this voltage rise. So voltage rise means uh, all of a sudden uh, voltage go beyond uh, what is allowed. It's, it's something like, uh, 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 water flow with a, with a very high pressure in the pipe and then try to burst the pipe. So there is no point in delivering energy at a very high voltage, which is going to hurt the equipment and also damage some of the, the insulations and, and, and devices. And then uh, we had uh, problems of reverse power flow. <coughs> if you look at the uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, distribution system, those uh, distribution system were designed to accommodate power uh, in one direction. That means receiving power from the substation all the way to the load. Now, with the integration of uh, a PV in, in the form of rooftop in, the, in, in different household, now we are getting reverse power flow as well. That is going to uh, create a lot of problems, including some uh, protection issues and then a few other safety concerns as well. So another problem in the in the in the in the, in the distribution system level is the intermittency of the, uh, of the gener uh, intermittency uh, uh, created by the large scale uh, 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 massive integration of rooftop PV. Just to give you an idea, <coughs> I have highlighted and then captured this real uh, waveform uh, the 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 power versus uh, time in from UQ solar. You can see um, how badly this power can vary. Uh, from maximum value to uh, a very low value. This could happen due to a change in the solar radiance. So the intermittency of uh, generation, uh, not, not only this is a problem in the in the distribution system, but also it's a, it's a huge problem in the transmission system collectively as well. So that means we have to have certain generators to ramp up and then take that uh, uh, slack to uh, supply the, the loads uh, uninterrupted uh, without any problem. And then distribution system stability is another concern. We can just uh, bring down the distribution system to dark. And then uh, change of the load pattern is another issue. So uh, we are having so-called duck curve and the very needle peak and then very low, even reverse power flow in, 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 in some uh, time. So these are some uh, real issues in the distribution system. And definitely the, the, the system stability is, is one of the major issues. We will look at some 
uh, uh, technical work we have done uh, to to uh, address those uh, uh, distribution system stability in particular uh, stability called distribution system vote stability so when it comes to transmission system so in the transmission system uh, uh, collectively power system security is uh, very uh, crucial for minute by minute operation of the entire power system and then wind and pv technologies these are the two uh, major renewable energy technologies comes with a lot of intermittency uh, no or low inertia inertia means this rotating energy uh, uh, energy that we have in the synchronous machine is absent in the in the in the wind and uh, pv technology as a result of this one we can see uh, uh, many uh, problems uh, which can threaten the security of the system traditionally power system instability this is the area i have been working on for the last 25 years can be classified into angle stability so we have this uh, magnitude and the phase angle the angle could get affected and then there could uh, uh, there could be an issue called uh, uh, transient instability losing synchronism losing power plants uh, one after the other in a cascaded fashion and then there could be uh, another instability problem voltage instability voltage instability instability happen because of a uh, uh, lack of reactive power in the system what happens uh, for in a from a layman point of view the voltage is good as a result of this intermittency and some dynamics in the system voltage is going to drop down and then collapse eventually even though there are a uh, number of different controls control mechanism and protection put in place sometime whenever there is a coincidence of incident voltage instability can happen the other interesting uh, uh, major branch of instability problem is uh, frequency instability so that means we as you all know we get supply at 50 hertz so what happens as a result of this lack of inertia so the frequency uh, drop and then in some cases it collapses so this lead to frequency instability all these three branches can threaten the power system leading to a blackout so with the renewable energy integration all these three branches of power system instability are affected and if you look at some recent events and uh, uh, observation we found that uh, frequency instability is uh, it's becoming more and more frequent in in power system with renewable energy so this is where i wanted to bring two incidents uh, which uh, uh, happened recently uh, wanted to highlight uh, the problem and, and and some commonality one uh, was in uh, 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 south australia where we had uh, a large number of uh, wind penetration and then uh, the other one is uh, the east england blackout that happened uh, just last year so when we look at the south australian blackout that happened on the 28th of uh, uh 2006 so just prior to that incident the scada the the the, the information uh, uh, data acquisition system showed there were 850000 customer customers uh, 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 were supplied with uh, closer to 1800 megawatt of electric electricity south australia alone if you look at the whole uh, eastern grid um, it may be about uh, 22000 23000 uh, peak uh, uh, 22 23, 23000 megawatt or 23 uh, gigawatts of uh, peak demand but i'm talking about here only the uh, 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 south australia so at the point of uh, the, uh, just before that uh, 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 blackout uh, we had uh, 1826 megawatt of uh, 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 demand and then these demand was supplied by uh, a wind a substantial amount of uh, 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 share uh, was uh, supplied by wind energy we can notice that one closer to 50% and then uh, about 600 megawatt was uh, uh, supplied by two interconnections um, those of you who know this one uh, south australia is interconnected with uh, victoria through two uh, uh, interconnections one is haywood uh, interconnection the other one is uh, murray link and then haywood uh, interconnection uh, it's an ac connection murray link is about uh, a dc connection a fixed uh, uh, a 200 megawatt connection and then in, in addition to those two uh, there was uh, 330 uh, megawatt gas generation as well let's see what happened on the on the on the day uh, uh, leading to this blackout event so there were uh, a tornado 
um, this was uh, usual uh, during that time of uh, uh, the year. And then uh, the ranging from 190 to 260 kilometer per hour occurred. And uh, naturally, uh, th these are not friendly for transmission system. And then the, these two tornadoes simultaneously damage a single cir circuit and also another double circuit lines or transmission line, creating a lot of faults in the system. So when there are faults, these uh, 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 wind turbines, which are relatively new, uh, are vulnerable to this one. And then they react and then they either uh, uh, reduce power or, or try to adjust uh, things according to the situation. So the sequence of uh, 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 faults in quick succession, almost uh, 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 six voltage dips as a result of this uh, uh, fault happened over a period of uh, two minutes. This happened around uh, 4.16 on uh, September 28th. The number of fault on the transmission line grow as, as the, the tornado uh, continued. Out of these uh, nine wind farms, and uh, uh, there are about nine wind farms, and then uh, uh, this is mainly located in uh, uh, the the south of uh, the north uh, mid north of uh, South Australia, and then as a result of this reduction, uh, the, the 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 voltage dip, the wind farms uh, uh, showed some reduction in uh, power as as a result of uh, 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 fault uh, activated. So activation of the uh, the fault features in this one, even though that there are. Uh, 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 what we call a fold right through capability uh, put in place in the wind farm and then uh, the power had to be reduced in those wind farms to uh, protect those turbines. So what happened was uh, as a result of the sustained generation, uh, sustained uh, uh, fault uh, in the system, uh, a generation reduction was resulted from these wind farms that was about uh, uh, 450 megawatts. So there were fault, as a result of fault, the wind farm reacted and then reduced the supply. So the, 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 the reduction in wind farm, where do they, uh, the, the system has to rely on somewhere. So they just go for the interconnections uh, and, and, and try to get more power from those interconnections. As a result of this one, and then maximum power was uh, trying to flow from the uh, Haywood interconnection. So that also went to the maximum capacity, the Haywood uh, capacity. At that time, the Murray link, the second interconnection was already uh, 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 operating at the, at, the, at, the, at the maximum capacity. Approximately about 700 milliseconds after the reduction from the last wind turbine, the, the Victoria South Australia Haywood interconnection reached the maximum level and then it couldn't tolerate and then it tripped offline. Now, we have a scenario where there is a, an island formed, even though the, the, the Haywood uh, inter, uh, Murray link is still uh, hanging on, but uh, we didn't have uh, a sufficient generation in the South Australian system to feed up the load. Ideally, uh, the system load shading should have worked. Unfortunately, the load shading also didn't work. And uh, we will see uh, shortly, um, the row curve, so-called uh, the rate of change of frequency uh, 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 drop was uh, significant that uh, none of these protection scheme worked and then uh, everything tripped. So with, without substantial load shading, the system separation uh, was imminent and then uh, uh, at about uh, uh, 418, the blackout had happened. So the AMO analysis showed uh, 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 the frequency collapse was uh, inevitable. That's what they in included. So, like uh, the doctors uh, look at the uh, uh, the pressure and the heartbeat and all these things. As power system engineers, we look at those uh, frequency trace and voltage trace. So this is the the voltage trace in the in the Haywood interconnection. As we can see, so we had some dips. So these are the voltage dips that caused the problem. Uh, of uh, uh, wind, uh, uh, wind generation reduction and then these uh, dips continued and then you can see this is the point uh, the collapse can happen and then uh, if you look at the 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 frequency trace so you can see on the other side of uh, the interconnection that means victorian side so the red line 
and the and the yellow one uh, the the blue one is on the south australian side so as a as a result of high generation in the in the in the in the victorian side the frequency shoot up as a result of uh, low generation and more demand the frequency dropped and then frequency drop dropped to a point that it couldn't recover it's collapsed so this slide shows the uh, uh, the row curve the the so called row curve uh, row curve means rate of change of frequency uh, there are relays uh, put in place uh, row curve relays uh, are usually set as uh, 0.5 hertz per second if anything beyond that one the relays are going to trip uh, different uh, uh, loads and, and generation to protect from the, the the rest of the system so here we can see the row curve was uh, very significant and uh, something similar happened in uh, east england in incident the, the main point I, i would like to highlight from the the the, the previous incident is that uh, we had significant uh, uh, generation of, of wind farm and then uh, perhaps if we had uh, synchronous generators we could have avoided but doesn't mean that uh, the, the wind farms are bad so we should have just uh, put some uh, uh, control measures uh, in place uh, at least uh, as a last line of defense we should have uh, put some uh, load shading to protect uh, uh, and safeguard uh, uh, part of the uh, part of the system and then uh, the east england uh, 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 blackout what happened was something similar um, it happened on the august 9th uh, the weather conditions were anticipated but there is no change in the in the in the generation it was uh, uh, predicted as same as a week before uh, it was on a friday and then uh, if you look at uh, the how those uh, the demands are met we can see 30% from wind significant uh, uh, proportion of the generation is uh, coming from wind and then 30% from uh, 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 30% is about uh, uh, wind and uh, the 30% is from gas fired and another 20% from uh, uh, nuclear and also there are uh, interconnections uh, uh, there are three interconnections uh, to east england uh, system Uh, uh with uh, uh, the neighboring countries uh, even some of those are uh, uh, we are see cables and at about uh, 1652 uh, again there was a lightning strike on the transmission line um, which uh, uh, took the circuit out in uh, in the mid mid of uh, 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 east england system uh, an area called uh, 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 eaton seacon and uh, wemonly main and then protection system operated immediately and disconnecting uh, and, and clearing the fault within 1 seconds and the line reset again and returned to normal within 20 seconds but however there were so many lightning strikes and then uh, the system was uh, uh, designed to cope up with over uh, a number of lightning strikes uh, however in, in this particular incident uh, due to a coincidence of incidents this uh, 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 there was a loss uh, 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 of uh, uh, not only wind for power generation but also a small loss of uh, uh, so called distributed generator losses uh, happened and then that started all this uh, chaotic event in the in the in the, in the system so at about uh, 4:52 immediately immediately following the lightning strike and uh, within a few seconds two large uh, uh, wind farms uh, not only uh, wind farms but also a gas fired power plant uh, had to uh, be uh, stop uh, from the generation so this has uh, created a vacuum of uh, generation the total generation lost was about uh, uh, 1400 and then that uh, 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 1400 uh, Uh, generation had created a big vacuum and then uh, uh, allowed the frequency to swing the results was eventually uh, the system uh, again uh, there are two the uh, uh, the load shading didn't work and then finally they have to uh, uh, take out the, uh, the 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 system and then uh, uh, they there was some uh, uh, they call it as uh, Uh, uh the demand interruptions and then uh, 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 low frequency demand disconnection 
and then uh, as a result of this uh, low uh, demand uh, disconnection scheme they uh, uh, picked up and then uh, uh, disconnected a, a number of uh, loads which was about 5% which is significant and then uh, this was done to protect 95% uh, of the customers and then uh, 5% uh, and then the whole uh, uh, eastern england including a number of uh, 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 subways and then uh, a number of workplaces were uh, in 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 chaotic uh, situation so there was a frequency collapse so at about uh, 4:57 uh, on august 19 the frequency was uh, restored back and then uh, uh, one by one uh, the distribution network operators began to reconnect uh, the system and then uh, at about uh, 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 5 uh, 37 uh, the, the system back to normal now let us look at the solutions so uh, when it comes to solutions and uh, as i mentioned there are different types of uh, uh, problems uh, in the transmission level and the distribution level. So here we are looking at uh, one of the distribution level instability problem. Here what we are doing is we are trying to find uh, the solution within the technology itself by um, having a better control. So if you look at, uh, we have done this uh, study in a, in a test system. So uh, we, we, we run a number of different cases and then uh, 0% that's the normal uh, uh, business as usual case, 25% penetration, and then uh, the case 2, 50% uh, penetration. Case 4 was 50% penetration with the so-called uh, low voltage write through capability. And then we can see if we don't have this low voltage write through capability, which is case number 4, this is a, a dotted line, a dark dotted line, we, we will have problem. And similarly, uh, no, uh, uh, pin, uh, no PV penetration, also no, no problem. And here we have to understand that uh, the, the dynamic voltage stability, it's, uh, it's possible in the distribution system, which can be driven by the uh, uh, induction uh, motors in the system. As a result of the dynamics uh, between the induction motor and the system, the, the, the uh, dynamic voltage instability can happen. So we, um, um, went on to uh, look at uh, uh, and develop s solutions. So here we um, uh, tried an approach called uh, uh, dynamic voltage support by uh, using the capability within the wind farm just to deliver reactive power and to give the voltage support by, by following different schemes. One is a, a, P current, a, a constant P current scheme. The other one is a constant active current scheme. The other one is constant uh, active power scheme. I don't want to go into the technical detail of this one. What we are trying to do is we are trying to use the capability within the wind, uh, rooftop wind turbines. Not every uh, uh, rooftop PV can be uh, uh, installed with this one. One or two uh, in, in the proper location, uh, appropriate size can be installed with this one. With this uh, 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 dynamic voltage capability, we can uh, show that one not only for a, a closer fold, but also for a far away fold. Far away uh, fold means it's more uh, uh, a problematic one. We can just overcome this dynamic voltage stability problem, which it's a, 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 a threat uh, to the distribution system uh, for uh, when we have a high penetration of uh, renewable energy. So this uh, another case study, uh, where we are looking at uh, a high penetration of uh, uh, renewable energy, how it impacts on the angle stability problem. In particular, a problem called low frequency oscillation. What happens? Everything is normal. Uh, one fine day, some uh, event happened in the system. There is some oscillation uh, uh, grow up and the system separate into part. So we have done this one in the, in the, in the Java Bali system. And then here we are looking at uh, battery energy storage as a potential, large battery energy storage as a potential solution as uh, 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 the South Australia uh, 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 done after the blackout. Here we are looking at a large scale battery energy storage as a solution to uh, remove this uh, oscillation problem. So here, uh, when we have done the case study, we, we identified uh, two modes, two, two weak modes uh, are the, uh, the, the, the uh, creating problem. One is an interior mode. For those of you who uh, uh, 
don't know this uh, uh, oscillation phenomena in the, in the interior mode what happens is two group of generators far apart from two geographical area oscillate against each other and then creating problem after some time they just uh, uh, create problem and, and then the system uh, uh, get into trouble the other problem not so cba as the interior a local problem so in that particular system we identified two modes uh, as a, as a problem matrix board one is a, one is a local mode mode 2 the other one is an interior mode so we are trying to uh, uh, design a power oscillation damper in the battery by using traditional uh, power oscillation uh, 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 controller which is based on the the, the, the conventional uh, method of uh, uh, parameter optimization we also used a gray wolf uh, algorithm for picking up the right parameters to have a better damping. So these two bottom graphs shows that uh, by having the, the battery energy storage with this power oscillation damping controller with the gray wolf algorithm can provide a better damping. So when it comes to industrial standard, we are looking at 5% or more in the damping. Um, uh, when we have this uh, 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 controller, the battery energy storage and the and the and the and the and the, uh, the, uh, the appropriate tuning, we can achieve uh, 15 percent uh, 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 of of damping. And definitely, this 15 percent is reducing as we grow with the renewable energy. If you look at this one, so the local mode, we can see we can accommodate up to 40 percent of renewable energy, still achieving 5 percent renewable in the local mode. So when it comes to uh, interior mode, which is considered as the problematic, we can achieve. Uh, over 50% renewable, uh, not having this problem. So the other case study uh, uh, we have is the is the, it's a frequency uh, instability problem. So what we found was uh, when it comes to frequency instability, uh, two factors are important. One is inertial response. The other one is uh, primary frequency regulation. And then uh, these are the, some frequency traits for uh, different penetration of uh, renewable energy. As you can see, um, 25%, 50% is okay, still within the margin, 60% creating a problem. And then uh, the bottom graph here is uh, showing the row curve. The row curve is uh, going to an unacceptable level. So we have to do something about it. So what we had done here in terms of solution, we looked at uh, the best solutions. Of course, uh, the battery uh, uh, technology is good. However, here we are proposing a hybrid uh, solutions, uh, high powered and high energy solution and combining them to have a better results. And then when uh, we also have done, uh, we have done some cost analysis as well. So the spider web uh, suggests the uh, combined cost analysis, the battery energy storage and uh, uh, super capacitor energy storage found to be the, the, the most cost effective. And then uh, th that uh, combination doing the job uh, uh, very well and then uh, uh, suppressing those uh, uh, problem and then uh, uh, pulling up the, the frequency uh, level back to normal. And then uh, a, a summary, I hope I'm, I'm doing all right with the time and, and a summary and a way forward. And uh, achieve, achieving high penetration of renewable energy in my opinion, is it far from a reality? And uh, definitely one should consider a good mix, not only the, the PV technology and, and also wind technology, the other technologies uh, which can uh, uh, utilize the synchronous machine should also be brought uh, in an appropriate scale to have the frequency support, to have the voltage support, to have enough strength in the system. And uh, we saw few technical challenges. Definitely there are a number of uh, uh, technical challenges as well as regulatory challenges. On the other hand, if you look at uh, the other development, uh, electric vehicles are coming up, which are uh, essentially energy storages. So the, energy, uh, the electric vehicle combined with uh, battery energy so storage should be used in a coordinated manner, in a, in a smarter way. What, what I mean by smart uh, is that uh, we use uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning technique together with uh, big data for monitoring and uh, uh, enhancing the performance of uh, uh, the system. Uh, still accommodating a, a, a high percentage of renewable energy. 
and uh, definitely a lot of r and d's are needed we have to stay on top of everything uh, otherwise we could just see some uh, events like what we had seen in south australia and uh, and, and and the eastern grid so definitely there is a possibility for universities and power utilities to work together and then uh, yeah that's uh, end my presentation i'll stop here shamil uh, back to you for yeah thank you mithulan uh, for that very uh interesting presentation uh now i would like to open the session for questions uh from the audience uh unfortunately our chat line may not be working so uh, if you want to ask a question please uh, unmute yourself and uh, uh introduce yourself and then please ask a question from mitchell and i'm sure he'll be happy to uh, respond to it De definitely yeah Mithulan, I am Nilanta and a water resource engineer. Yes. And uh, I have a question regarding uh, that uh, <clears throat> achieving very high percentage of renewable uh, energy in a network through uh, other mechanisms like uh, using renewable energy to pump water to upstream reservoirs like a Snowy 2, like uh, the new scheme, like that will give the inertia during the the, the the frequency dropouts and other issues. Uh, ca can we use that sort of technologies to store energy on a upstream? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. When it comes to uh, uh, storing energy in Ilanta, yeah, um, storing energy in the in the upper reservoir is one way. Of course, that's going to be slow. And then other possibilities are to use uh, uh, the renewable energy to drive some pumps. Right. Okay. Yeah. If there is some rotating uh, inertia in the system, definitely yeah. there is a possibility to contribute to the uh, the rotating energy. Okay. Uh, yeah. In the that form means. Of, uh, 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 yeah. Some rotating machines like, like uh, uh, heavy drums with the uh, weight and with a, a bit of a like a you you need that few milliseconds to run through the system like that sort of thing. You uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Like uh, we are looking at. Uh, milliseconds range and then uh, what's going to happen is uh, uh, if it is a rotating machine that's going to slow down to release the energy to balance and then arrest the frequency otherwise the frequency is going to go down as i said be below rho cov that's going to create problems in the system not only harming the generation uh, but also harming the loads okay yeah, if we have any technologies uh, flywheel is considered as uh, one of the options uh, uh, to provide uh, this uh, inertia support and then there are yeah uh, uh, pumping technology in, in the northern queensland uh, there are some work going on uh, uh, to consider the pump storage as an option of course there are going to be some limitations with that one in terms of uh, releasing the energy back and, and the time constant involved in that one okay all right thank you Hi, uh, I'm Sunil uh, from SCAT Engineering, Sydney. Uh, what's your thoughts about battery storage to uh, iron out this uh, uh, load, uh, you know, of peak and peak uh, demands? And also, what what's your idea about having this carbon credit uh, to uh, make uh, people more aware of the renewable energy and get used to that? Yeah, the, the first question, uh, yeah, easy to answer, Sunil. Like, uh, yes, definitely, um, if we are going to be uh, uh, accommodating a high penetration of renewable energy, there is no other way other than having batteries in the system. Definitely, batteries can do a lot of things, not only a single source, but also, uh, as I mentioned, hybrid source. We should be just looking at the capabilities of batteries, uh, not only for uh, uh, one particular work, uh, for example, in uh, uh, this uh, uh, South Australian system, the battery is sitting there and then storing energy and also it's uh, supporting the frequency. I believe it's 70-30. So that kind of things uh, can be done. So battery is inevitable. The storage is inevitable when, when we are trying to achieve 100% renewable. With the other carbon credit, I'm honestly not an expert uh, to comment on that one. And uh, yes, maybe th there is a way to create awareness and also to put a tax on uh, 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 polluting type of uh, uh, sources. 
and then promote the renewable energy. But, but uh, yeah, it looks like a carbon credit uh, didn't work in some places and uh, worked well in some other places. Yeah, because uh, it's become a bit political and people talk about all these energy credits, everything, but uh, it doesn't translate into the field, you know, so. Yeah, green, so. Ener uh, green certificate and all these things. There are a number of different schemes. Uh, I believe uh, regardless of those schemes and then uh, renewable energy is coming uh, in a big way and, and we are not far from achieving this uh, yeah, a, a good uh, penetration. Okay, thanks. A quick question from me, uh, sure, sure, sure. nobody else. In terms of uh, costs to come uh, for a stable renewable energy system, uh, competing with uh, traditional uh, power sources like coal or gas or whatever, uh, have you got some sort of a time frame to before they can compete on equal footing without any subsidies and things like that? Yeah, uh, we can look at, uh, for example, PV. PV has come down in, in terms of levelized cost dramatically. And uh, we are, it was like a hundred dollar per kilowatt hour. Now we are looking at less than a dollar per kilowatt hour. And then uh, as uh, more and more uh, PV and, and wind come into the system, de definitely th these are going to be cost competitive. And then uh, the cost is coming down. I, I couldn't throw any figures, uh, uh, sharp figures, uh, to uh, um, compare this one with the traditional coal-fired. But, but the costs uh, are coming down for both technologies. Yeah. The PV has seen a massive decline in the in the in the in the the install capacity and and also on top of that one if you look at pv um, operating and maintenance cost is, is almost uh, nil except uh, cleaning and things and like that but when it comes to the other traditional technologies we have wear and tear and then a lot of uh, interruptions needed in that one uh, yeah on the other hand there are other issues as well like plant capacity Yes, uh, yeah. I thought one of the other issues is most of these plants, uh, big solar plants, wind plants are coming in very remote regions where there's plenty of uh, abundance of land. But so, but you need distribution systems to connect those uh, plants into the mainstream. So that adds a fair cost to the whole uh, operation, doesn't it? I, I agree. Yeah, uh, where we uh, um, um, there, there was some work on that one uh, using the AC interconnections and DC interconnections, and, and in some cases it found to be yeah, DC interconnections are, are, are much uh, cheaper when we look at things collectively. Uh, of course, uh, these uh, large scale wind farm, the mega uh, scale wind farms, are go not going to be located uh, closer to the city center. They are going to be lo located far away, and then uh, with the technology. Uh, and they, there are uh, so-called uh, grid forming technology uh, put in place. Uh, grid forming inverters are put in place with the with the uh, wind farms, which can uh, not only deliver energy but also can uh, control the voltage and then uh, uh, pro provide the local uh, voltage support. Yeah, uh, transmission definitely transmission is an issue, and then uh, we are. Uh, either uh, uh, DC transmission uh, or, or even uh, th there are some uh, uh, pilot project in China looking at uh, uh, what we call a fractional frequency transmission, which is not yet uh, commercially available everywhere. And at least in one project, uh, they try to transmit the power at the, at the, at the, at the fraction of the 50 hertz, not DC, not the uh, AC fraction of the 50 hertz. The good thing about that one, the electrical distance uh, uh, having a, a fractional frequency can be brought to less and less. So that means uh, uh, there are benefits of having that one, but but that's not uh, commercially uh, available in many, many countries. So when it comes to transmission, yeah, uh, uh, transmission is an issue and uh, DC uh, 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 transmission could be thought of as a, as an alternative. Thank you.
You're welcome. Yeah. Hello. This is Muthu from Griffith University. Uh, well, it's a very well presentation. Uh, Mithiran, uh, wonderful lot of uh, <coughs> information. I wonder uh, you mentioned that uh, the AI, ML, uh, big data, yes, and also regulatory aspects. Uh, uh, and uh, I wonder if you will be able to comment on uh, the study done or the thoughts uh, about incentivizing uh, customers to uh, change their behavior, effectively changing the the load pattern example with the electric vehicle whether you know I could charge it now or at a different time Absolutely, yes. and then crediting it. Uh, uh, is there something happening some work or what are your thoughts on that? Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, Dr. Muthu for that uh, question. Yeah, it's a very good question and uh, definitely uh, these are uh, coming up uh, uh, in the AI and machine learning techniques uh, uh, and big data coming up in the, in 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 uh, research, in, in uh, uh, power system related research. Just to give you an example, this uh, 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 Grey-Wolf algorithm we have used uh, to uh, have a better uh, parameters. Um, so we, we tune those uh, uh, controller parameters by using this uh, Grey-Wolf algorithm, which resulted in a better uh, performance. That's one example. Um, the other example, the, the other uh, uh, comment you made about uh, the customer behavior and then optimizing things, definitely uh, the big data uh, and, and machine learning techniques can play a role uh, in, uh, in, in, in suggesting a, a better uh, uh, system in terms of cost uh, saving, not only, for the, uh, uh, not only for the customers, but also for the power utilities. Uh, having electric vehicle uh, in the backyard and then what time to charge and uh, what is the state of charge and all these can be done uh, with the help of this uh, yeah uh, big data and then uh, yeah the machine learning algorithms uh, or, or AI al algorithms and then there is a lot of scope uh, I, I haven't uh, done uh, uh, many of these studies except in my domain uh, as I'm dealing with uh, uh, power system stability, we uh, uh, use controllers and then try to use those uh, uh, controllers uh, uh, design and parameter optimization uh, by using uh, machine learning techniques and AI techniques. Uh, and then uh, slowly we are moving on to uh, uh, forecasting domain where again uh, these are uh, um, artificial intelligent techniques or, or, or this support vector machines uh, and things like that can be used. What are the benefits of using uh, those uh, techniques for a better forecast? We can have a, a, a faster and more accurate forecast and, and with a relatively less amount of uh, input. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. We are keen on trying to see if blockchain technology can be used uh, uh, for the incentivization and also transactions, uh, but uh, I'll discuss offline. Thank you, Evelyn. Definitely, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Any more questions, uh, please? Uh, this is uh, 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 Derek Fernando. Uh, just a very, very general question, uh, probably probably not directly related to your presentation, but you, you did show a slide, you know, earlier on where you showed uh, energy renewables, you know, the targets achieved by various countries around the world. Uh, I'm just wondering where does, uh, where does Australia stand in terms of achieving uh, uh, various forms of uh, renewable energy? Are we doing well or, or not so good? Yeah, we are doing uh, uh, very good, uh, Fernando. Yeah, um, especially with uh, PV, I think we are uh, now one of the top 10. We have closer to, uh, I couldn't remember the exact figures, uh, closer to, we started with wind, massive wind in, in, in South Australia. And then uh, now we have closer to 10 or 11 gigawatts of uh, uh, PV capacity. We are doing good. 
and that definitely we can do better than that one having a, a beautiful sunshine in, in most part of uh, uh, australia collectively I, I don't know where we are placed but uh, definitely with uh, pv technology we, we are uh, uh, well within uh, 10 i believe yeah 10th or uh, uh, last year so um, uh, we we managed to sneak into the top 10 list yeah that's that's very good if you are within the first 10 you know that's yes. a very good uh, achievement yeah thanks and, and then there are more uh, more and more uh, uh, large scale uh, uh, plants coming up that is going to put us in even in a better uh, position uh moving in the ladder and then capturing yeah uh, uh, the the, the uh, better spot yeah i can add to that because there are very very large one of the largest schemes coming up in northern territory and parts of uh, uh queensland as well so they are not yet in in in, in uh, online so when they come up i'm sure we will climb up that ladder quickly mm -hmm. Th thanks, Shamal, for sharing that one. Uh, definitely, uh, large-scale uh, PV farms are, are, are going to be one of the ways uh, to achieve this uh, yeah, high penetration of renewable energy. And then uh, definitely, uh, it has to be designed in such a way to uh, accommodate uh, uh, some of the problems. Um, uh, having a, a, a grid-forming inverters rather than grid-following inverters. What does it mean? It should be able to support the voltage locally, not really simply following what the grid is uh, dictating the PV farms to follow. Yeah, that's good because because the the higher we achieve, you know, the costs will come down and more affordable to the people, and it becomes a very attractive uh, form of energy, alternative forms of energy, uh, which people will would like to go with uh, low level low, low cost energy you know yes rather than uh, rather than going with the uh, traditional uh, uh, traditional you know there are some, yeah uh, i just wanted to make a comment there are some concerns and i i, I thought that uh, these are temporary uh, interacting with some of my colleagues in aemo uh, some of the wind farms large scale wind farms are not allowed to connect because of this intermittency issues um, and then, uh, as a result of that one, there was a little bit slow down on the on the on the on the on the progress in the large scale wind farm. But uh, definitely, th there are technologies uh, which can address that issue as well. Yeah, I think we are fast running out of time. Uh, can we have one last question? Uh, if uh, there are any more. So if there are no more questions, uh, can I invite Chanaka Abhisingha, a member of our management committee and also the technical committee to give a word of thanks, please? Thanks, Dr. Shamal. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, this presentation. I think this was a very timely topic because uh, uh, as a uh, Professor Mithulan mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, most of our environmental um, problems uh, such as global warming as a result of emissions from conventional power generation methods. So the future of um, uh, energy generation is renewable so resources, which are naturally replenished. So uh, we were fortunate to listen to a great presentation which gave us in-depth knowledge uh, of delivery and storage of renewable energy and uh, how to make it a better penetration. So on behalf of uh, uh, IS, uh, Management Committee of ISL Queensland chapter, I would like to thank Professor Mithul Nadraj for his great presentation on a timely topic uh, after accepting our invitation. Also, I would like to uh, thank 4EB Radio Sri Lanka Group and Newsletter promoting this event among the Brisbane community. Uh, I would like to extend our uh, thank uh, uh, 
uh, an appreciation for all the attendees uh, registering for this event and may allocating their time to attend this event. I also would like to thank everyone in the uh, uh, Queensland chapter and all the subcommittee members who uh, uh, paid their contribution to make this event successful. I would like to make a special thank to uh, Bandula Kapukatua, our management committee member who was our IT facilitator who organized everything for this webinar. He did a great job. Uh, more importantly, I would like to present this memento to uh, Professor Mithulan on behalf of the uh, management committee and the technical subcommittee uh, for uh, his great presentation. In ideal scenario, it would have been better if you were able to present this uh, in front of this whole crowd uh, to you. Unfortunately, COVID-19 restriction didn't allow us to do. However, uh, in coming days, we will arrange to the, uh, hand this over to you. So, Thank you. No worries. Uh, so this bring us, uh, uh, this bring our program to the conclusion. Thank you for everyone for their attendance. Yeah, just before we finish, I'll make a quick last announcement. So we are planning our next CPD event somewhere around October and we will keep you informed with the details in due course. We look forward to seeing you all uh, at the next CPD event. Thanks again, Mithulan, for your presentation, and thank you all for the audience for participating. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Yeah. Thanks, Shama. Thank you. 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 Thank you.